Now this is not something like cooking, uh, baking a cake where you take six eggs and uh, one pound of flour and a brick of butter and you mix it all together and you put yeast in and you mix that all in together and you turn the temperature up for this amount of uh, thing and you know and uh, you put it in the oven at 250 or 400 degrees Fahrenheit and you leave it in there for a certain amount of time and after 45 minutes ding and you have a cake it doesn't work like that now if you're looking for that type of information this is not the video for you this video is talks about what the general things are that these animals require to spawn and uh, what you can do in terms of helping out if you find value in this content please share it with your networks like facebook and on all the groups that you are a member of so I, it helps out the channel as well as uh, helps me out so i can continue to make more videos like this for you guys the faster the channel grows the more i can justify this making these videos and spending about 20 hours on average per week making five six videos for you guys i spend about four hours per video filming and editing as as well as another additional amount of time coming up with the content and doing all the research so i would really appreciate if you can help me share this channel with all your networks and uh, help me grow this channel as soon as possible thank you so much for your continued support what's going on everybody it's your boy malik welcome back to malik's water garden in this video we're going to look at something you guys have all wanted me to make which is how to breed your playcos this is going to be more of a general video talking about the general family loricarian or loricaridae uh, the super family uh, where all of our playcos belong to there's about a thousand different species a uh, little bit over I'm guessing uh, and uh, they're all described and then there's about probably another several hundred that are not described that we haven't even found yet or that we have uh, in our tanks that are, have not yet been described this is one of the most successful freshwater tropical species of fish or types of uh, families of fish I would say in existence out of all the 6,000 plus tropical freshwater fishes that are described about one-sixth of them are loricarians or so catfish armored catfish uh, so about a thousand plus okay and there's a little bit more probably there's a lot more that have not been even described so many of these animals like to spawn in in caves and crevices and uh, so we're gonna look at those types of fish the majority of the fish we like to keep are uh, cave spawners and uh, there are other types there are sand spawners and uh, there are substrate spawners that sub spawn right on top of the substrate and then there's uh, there are also lip brooders that like to brood, brood their their eggs on their lips and uh, there are also like animals that spawn on surfaces like a, a piece of slate or a, a leaf or something like that so there's a lot of different variation of spawning habit uh, habits for these animals but the vast majority of the fish that we like to keep and breed are cave spawners and in this video we're only going to look at that type of uh, loricariids so um, if you do want me to make videos of other types of loricariids I don't really keep many other types that most every every loricarid I keep except for the auto sinkless are all cave spawners and uh, I, I like that because that is how I like to keep and breed my uh, my fish and uh, so this is what I focus on predominantly if you do want me to make videos in, in uh, about individual species that i keep as well i can do that so comment below and let me know and subscribe to the channel if you haven't because it really helps me out as well and hit that notification icon so you get updated when those videos as well as many other videos like this get uploaded to the channel so in today's video we're going to look at how to spawn your loricariids that like to spawn in caves so obviously you need to have caves right now this is not something like cooking, uh, baking a cake where you take six eggs and uh, one pound of flour and a brick of butter and you mix it all together and you put yeast in and you mix that all in together and you turn the temperature up for this amount of uh, thing and you know and uh, you put it in the oven at 250 or 400 degrees Fahrenheit and you leave it in there for a certain amount of time and after 45 minutes ding and you have a cake it doesn't work like that now if you're looking for that type of information this is not the video for you this video is talks about what the general things are that these animals require to spawn and uh, what you can do in terms of helping out 
Uh, oftentimes people tell me that I am a great breeder, I'm a master breeder. I've been called a master breeder so many times and uh, people always say, you're so good at breeding fish. I don't know how to react to that because I'm not a master breeder. I'm not good at breeding fish. It's not something I do that these animals breed. I'm not physically making the animal breed. I'm not breeding, you know, when somebody says you're good at breeding the animals, it's not like I take the animals in my hands and say, okay, go breed. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's not like I, I do anything particularly uh, to get these particular animals to breed. Now, if you look around the fish room and you've obviously seen some of the other tanks that I have, there's other species of high ancestors that I'm keeping and I seem to have quite a bit of success with this group here right now. And uh, we're going to talk about why that is, in my opinion. And one of the main reasons, I believe, uh, this actually, this male here has now another clutch of eggs. That's his fourth clutch confirmed that he spawned. There's at least 30 or 40 fry in the tank that are outside the cave. There's a bunch of eggs or, or, or little wigglers in the cave with him right now as well. And I believe that the second male, the second dominant male is also spawning because the amount of time from the first clutch to now is about six weeks. For him to have four confirmed clutches of eggs in six weeks is quite like remarkable. Even if he's going like one after the other, which he is really like every single time he has a fry come out, he has not left the cave for the last six weeks. I have not seen him come out to look for food. I have not seen him do anything. He has moved caves very briefly for about a day and moved back. That was it. Uh, that was like earlier on in the breeding season. Uh, and uh, that was the only time he left the cave. And that was between clutch one and clutch two, I believe. So, and uh, he's going gangbusters. So what am I doing to make this happen? I'm not doing anything really. That's I think what is really going on. Um, I've actually realized that every single time, aside from the fact that the, the fry seem to require the parent fish's uh, gut bacteria to be inoculated with the gut bacteria, from all the research that I have done and as well as uh, the, the readings that I have done as well as other people's research, is that every single time I pull the fry out or pull the cave out to pull the fry out, I believe I freak out the, the male. And uh, it takes him another two to three weeks to get comfortable to spawn again. And also, just me moving the caves around and all that stuff seems to freak out the entire group of fish. And it seems like that, that cave that they've used to spawn is not going to be used again until at least two to three weeks again, if the male comes back to that cave. That was really apparent to me on my L199 tank. When in, in his first spawn, I pulled him out with the cave and I left the cave and him. In a, in a breeder box, he was not happy about it. He kicked out all the fry throughout the entire thing. And uh, all the fry didn't make it because I, I kept taking them out as they were getting kicked out out of the bre breeder box like an idiot and uh, put them into a, a, um, a German breeder ring which was on a different tank. So they were not getting the gut bacteria I believe that they should, should have been getting. So they didn't make it, not single one of them. Uh, and it took him, he was just now, is he's back in the cave like after about six weeks he got comfortable to go back in the cave it took him six weeks to even go into any caves about four or five weeks he wasn't even going near the caves he was hiding in the back of the tank he was terrified so i believe i uh we have to stop doing this to our fish because they are very intelligent uh, a lot of these animals they live quite long lives and uh, they've come from the wild many of them and uh, they don't want to be disturbed at, especially at the time when they've spawned that is the time when they are feeling the most dominant. They've established their dominance through the entire aquarium and they've let all the other fish know that they're the most dominant fish. And to get almost uh, predated upon uh, or what it feels like would be being, being caught by a large fish and being eaten essentially uh, would not be a, 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 a pleasant feeling I would assume. And uh, the animals do get freaked out. I believe that doing that is not in our best interest. So what can we do to get these animals to breed? In this tank, I've removed all the animals that could potentially be a predator for the Placos. So there are the Placos, the L340 group, and uh, there's nine of them. And then there's a pair of Rhinoricaria lancelata or Rhinoricaria red lizard catfish, the L0108, not the lancelata, separate species. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of tetras swimming around, about 20 of them, and uh, one dwarf blue-eyed rainbow that I bred a long time ago. And uh, that's all there is in this tank. Uh, I am going to move some shrimp in here just because now I can move shrimp in here because there's no discus or anything else eating the shrimp. And I'm feeding it heavily. Now, you definitely need caves appropriate size for the fish. 
uh, a little tighter is fine nothing that the fish can go and get stuck in because they will uh, so whatever the size of the fish something a little bit bigger than the fish but you don't have to be too big they seem to like enjoy a snug fit so something that they can go into not get stuck but also wedge themselves in there if they if the need arises so that when they extend their fins that the the the, the, the sides of the cave is touching the sides of the fins and they can actually wedge themselves in there if they want to be be safe in there if another fish especially another male or whatever or larger fish tries to come and grab them out of the cave or predate on the eggs now uh, this seems to work I like to give a variety of caves so this is all based on the size of your fish if you are keeping larger species like the pseudocanthicus and stuff like that or anything that grows more than several inches you would want to try and keep them in large enough tanks so you can set up pairs so you can keep several of them in the tank without too much of an aggression issue and then you can pick out pairs and move them into like maybe a four foot by two foot by two foot tank so that's something each you it's dependent on each species so this is something you have to consider based on your particular species so we're going to talk more in detail about all the different species that i keep and how i breed those so uh, subscribe if you haven't for that videos that are coming up now in this video we're going to look at some of the basic things you need you definitely need caves so you need some type of hide with a closed back seems to work uh, an open back cave does not seem to work even for the rhine loricaria they have spawned in the open back pvc tubes but uh, it is hard for them to defend it and uh, the the male seems to leave the eggs after a few days because of pressures from the female or other fish now uh, the closed back caves a cave with one one opening seems to work really well don't get anything fancy with several openings and stuff that like that because it's really hard for the fish to defend so what you want to consider is that the ability for this animal to defend its territory this small area is going to be its spawning territory and oftentimes they don't leave the spawning territory uh, I like to keep sand in my tanks about an inch and a half layer if you try to keep more than that you will run into problems unless you do have like Malaysian trumpet snails and like stuff like that that are going to keep your sand bed healthy but uh, it seems to help for a lot of my fish they like to dig in the sand and stuff like that and uh, it seems to be a, a trigger for them to be more comfortable especially like these guys that are wild caught they seem to thrive in the sand bed uh, they dig through the sand and they eat all the snails we talked about this in one of the last videos check that out if you haven't i'll put a link to that at the end they're eating all the malaysian trumpet snails that are small in this tank it's a whole graveyard of snails and uh, they seem to love that the sand seems to help but it's not necessary in terms of uh, mandatory because a lot of breeders do breed them without sand the bare bottom tanks seem to be easier to clean and keep clean but it's also might not be most ideal to make the, the fish feel comfortable so it might take you longer in terms of a bare bottom tank with less decoration where the fish is not as comfortable as in these tanks where they are more way more comfortable to come out and interact and, and do their thing uh, so the more natural the tank it seems to be work better for most of the wild caught types at least in my experience in terms of uh, temperature and all that it is vastly dependent on the species but in general you want to keep your tanks a little on the warmer side so above 78 degrees but don't exceed 82 83 degrees fahrenheit which is uh, where you will start running into trouble with a lot of species because many of the species do not like to be that warm you don't want to go up to like closer to if you're closer in if your temperature is close to 90 degrees fahrenheit it's a little too warm for your playcos it's not uh, ideal that's not a temperature they would encounter in the wild i would i would say uh, long term now my fish seem to spawn uh from january all the way up to september october even november depending on the type the 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 the, the particular fish it's not species dependent or anything i believe it's just a comfort thing for the animal uh, there doesn't seem to be any triggers they just seem to like really clean water for some reason and uh, a water change seems to trigger spawning as well as prolonged periods of no water changes so it doesn't I don't know exactly what that correlates to because right now the temp uh, the TDS in here is about 245 parts per million and the nitrates are about 70 parts per million and uh, they're spawning like rabbits to explain that to me right and uh, when they first started spawning it was like when I was doing a lot of water changes the nitrates were really low and uh, so they were spawning really heavily during that period of time as well 
same with the L199. So uh, they seem to, like, the first spawn happened before water change, so it was like due for water change, I believe, or past due. And uh, then uh, now, when I did the water change, they all just started getting very frisky, and everybody was doing a lot of uh, dominant activity, domination activities. And the same with the 4 7 ones, I actually got some of it on film, the two males fighting and sparring. So I'll put that on the on the B-roll so you can see some of that. So there seems to be no very no exact trigger per se. Um, I believe that from my experience with some of the tank bred varieties as well as some of the tank bred zebra pecos and stuff, as long as you feed them a healthy diet and the fish are healthy and they're at their prime in terms of their physical abilities and uh, they are at breeding age and stuff like that and the water is clean and warm they definitely like to spawn all year round so uh just with the, the wild caught varieties they seem to be a little bit more finicky uh i don't know maybe it's because my temperature drops in the winter a couple of degrees but that doesn't seem to ma matter in january when the temperature is like super low in the whole room and they seem to spawn really well at you know when the temperature drops to 76 degrees i've had spawns out of some of the uh, Ryan Loricaria and stuff so like it all depends I believe on the individual fish but also at the same time I believe the, the temperature and all that stuff doesn't seem to be a huge effect per se in my experience at least so what I recommend is to keep them in generally warm temperatures and uh, feed them heavily and uh, give them clean water keep the nitrates low as much as possible and uh, if they are like doing well and eating well just be patient and they will spawn for you and when they do start spawning my recommendation is not to pull out the fry uh, and to let the fry raise the parents raise the fry in the tank if this is not a possibility don't pull out the fry until they're almost ready to come out of the cave now that point is when they are still in the cave and they're moving about they will be moving about inside the cave before they come out so you'll have about a day and a half before they actually start coming out that's when you want to pull out the fry, but I believe that by doing that, you are spooking out the male. So, I mean, that's a risk you are going to have to take, and that's something you have to assess based on your individual circumstance. If you do have other fish in the tank, and there's no other tanks that you can move the other fish to for the time being, then there's nothing else you can do except to pull the fry out. But if there's nothing else in the tank except the same type of placos and small tetras and stuff that cannot predate on the small fry, then you're totally fine and also uh, corridoras don't seem to predate on playful fry from my understanding corridoras are not really predacious uh, they're more like a detritivore they just dig through the sand and eat uh, detritus out of the sand there's a really good article that i came across by uh, ian fuller on his website we're going to look through that in the coming video about the type of substrates that you need to keep your corridoras in based on his own research as well as his own experience and uh, his trips to collect these animals and uh, experience the natural habitats they lived in. Also, we're co coming out with a new video about Playful Gut Bacteria that I've talked to you about quite extensively, which is going to be coming out soon. So subscribe if you haven't and stay tuned for that. If you have any questions, comment below and let me know. I just wanted to get this conversation started. This is not the end all be all. We're going to make so many videos about this topic and really look into all the different things that I do to keep each different species and breed each different species more in detail but I just want to get the conversation started with you guys and to show you how easy it is to breed these animals and how well adapted they are to breed naturally and there's not really much we have to do in terms of our own efforts to breed them like collecting eggs or pulling out the fry or anything like that now uh, in terms of fry raising and stuff like that we'll look in more detail about that so comment below and let me know if there's anything in particular you want to know and I will look at all those stuff in upcoming videos. As always, I thank you so much for your support. The channel is growing really fast. If you find value in this content, please share it with your networks like Facebook and on all the groups that you are a member of. So I, it helps out the channel as well as uh, helps me out so I can continue to make more videos like this for you guys. The faster the channel grows, the more I can justify this making these videos and spending about 20 hours on average per week making five six videos for you guys i spend about four hours per video filming and editing as as well as another additional amount of time coming up with the content and doing all the research so i would really appreciate if you can help me share this channel with all your networks and uh, help me grow this channel as soon as possible thank you so much for your continued support i love you all i'll see you on the next video
God bless you.